chapter 2. Acts 2 and verse 42. I'll, I'll put it up here as well. Acts 2, 42. Just, uh, just a short verse, but it will we'll start us on our way. Acts 2.42, and they, that is the church, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Just stop there for a moment. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, some people have said, have used the term, uh, they devoted themselves to these things. And uh, I like that term. I like that. They devoted themselves. It puts me in mind of a sermon uh, from, from an old American uh, evangelist many years ago who wrote a sermon called Devotions or Devotion. Devotions is the old-fashioned name you'd have for, uh, you know, you say, you say your prayers, say your prayers in the morning and at night. Maybe they would, they would learn their catechism, something like that. That was your devotions. But he's saying, is it devotions with you or is it devotion? See, devotion comes from the heart. It comes, it's what I really want. It's not out of a sense of duty. I'm not doing these things because that's what's expected. I do them because that is what I really, really want to do. And so this continuing steadfastly that the church did in these things, they're not doing them out of duty. They're doing them because this is what they really want to do. And by the way, contextually, if you look at this in Acts 2, yes, it's referring to the church, but it's referring, I think, specifically to the three Thousand souls who were saved in one day were added to the church. These are baby Christians. And now they don't say, well, of course, you've only just become a Christian, so we're not going to expect very much of you at this stage. No, they too devoted themselves to these things. And you know, the early church was surrounded by persecution, wasn't it? It was surrounded by people who meant them harm, people who wanted to kill them, or at least throw them in prison. Now, we don't really have that problem in the West so much today, although I'm sure there are people who would like to do away with this, but we also are surrounded, aren't we? We're surrounded by what the authorised version would probably call gainsayers, that is, people who are speaking against Christ and against his church. They don't like what the church represents. People don't like our moral stance. They don't like the church's traditions. They don't like uh, uh, what we practice and what we believe. And you know, this, this situation has caused some members uh, of the, if you like, the evangelical community to go into a sort of a mild panic and say, well, well, how come, you know, basically, how can we get people to like us more? And I'm remind, reminded of what the Apostle Paul said, where he said, you know, do I seek the praise of men? If I was seeking the praise of men, I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. Because, you see, the two go, don't go together. They didn't go together in the early days of the church, and they don't go together now. But what it has done is made the church start to think, well, maybe we need some new kind of approach. Maybe we need some, some new evangelicalism. Maybe we need some new ideas, some new thoughts. Maybe even a new translation of the Bible. If your, if your shelf could possibly squeeze one more in. I don't believe that this is what is, is needed today. In fact, what I think, uh, what I truly believe is needed, the only new thing we need is to be a New Testament church. 
It's not a looking to the future. What, how can the church change? How can the church be different? How can the church be liked more? It's what was the church like when Christ founded it? What, what did those disciples, those followers who were with Jesus, what did they do? How did they, how did they come together? What were their values? What were the essentials? And what were uh, the non-essentials? And I think this is going to be a real uh, challenge for us. I want to challenge you personally today as we go through these series of sermons on this particular subject. Can you find yourself in this New Testament church? As you read through what they were like, do you see yourself in that New Testament church? Do you see this fellowship in that New Testament church? It's a challenge to all of us. How do we fit with how they live? Now, I know a number of things are different today. Uh, our lives are not quite exactly the same as theirs. But this is what we have to decide um, what things have changed and what things basically remain the same. As we look into the pattern of what the New Testament church was, ask yourself the question, do I conform to that pattern? And if I don't, why don't I? Is it out of ignorance? Is it out of an insufficiency of the grace of God? Or is it simply that I choose not to conform to that pattern? These are really challenging uh, thoughts that I want to give you this morning. Not to condemn you, but to make you think, really, am I, am I living like the New Testament church? Like the church that the disciples uh, and Christ himself founded? That, were, that had its vitality from the Holy Spirit. Is that my Christianity? Or does my, does my Christianity look very different to it? So as we look to Acts 2.42, we saw that the early church continued steadfastly or devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. Now, some people, you say apostolic doctrine and they just sort of glaze over. This is very simple. Doctrine simply means teaching. So what we're looking at and what we're going to be looking at this morning is the teaching of the apostles. Purely and simply, the teaching of the apostles. We're going to look at three different points uh, this morning. How important was the teaching of the apostles? How would we define overall what that teaching was? And perhaps for me, the most fascinating, how was it communicated? I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go through. We're going to be looking at some points that I don't think we've ever looked at before as a church. It's going to be something you can really um, get your teeth into this series. And it's where the Lord leads. I don't know I don't know how many of these we're going to do. It's really as the Holy Spirit leads. But I believe they're very important for us at this time to look at. So, how essential, how important was the Apostles' teaching? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. And we'll start at verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The church is compared to a building uh, and to a family there, the household of God. And it's described as having a uh, foundation, just like a building, isn't it? And so, and so what we see here is that the, the apostles, particularly the teaching of the apostles, is foundational. It, it, it's essential. It go, it's underneath, it girds the whole building, the whole church, the whole house of God. 
the whole assembly of believers uh, has as its foundation this apostolic teaching, apostolic doctrine. These are, these are not ideas, suggestions, uh, personal views. That they're not something that the, a Christian can, you know, take it or leave it. Oh well, Paul says this, Peter says that. Yeah, I might agree with him. I might not agree. These are foundational to the building, to the temple of God. You know, we are that temple. We are that building, the house of God. And and what happens with a building if you start pulling away parts of the foundation? What's going to happen to the building? Cracks start to appear. One part pulls away from another part. In fact, the whole structure becomes dangerous, doesn't it? It becomes liable to collapse. The same with the church today. If we start to pull away at those foundations, the teachings of the apostles, the church itself is liable to start coming apart. One part one, one group of people will move away from another, cracks will appear, the structure will become uh, dangerous and it is even uh, liable to collapse. What is holding it all together? Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Friends, the danger of the church is when you and I start to reject elements of the apostles teaching and say, well that's not for our day, oh well that's too difficult, oh well that's going to offend some people, and we start to put away the apostles teaching, what we are effectively doing is pulling, tugging at the foundations of the church. The ultimate act of destruction, the ultimate apostasia is in fact the rejection of Christ himself. Once Christ has been rejected, once that teaching of the apostles has been rejected, all you are left with is a religious institution. That is not a church. That is not a church. And so in our day, what we need to look at is what did the apostles teach? Now we have a record of what the apostles taught in the Bible. We don't have everything they said, everything they taught, but we have. God has left us in his providence what they said. We cannot reject what the apostles said. We cannot sit in judgment on the word of God and start to change and alter it compared by, by looking at our society. What, what, do our, what do we do today? How do we think about things today? Right, well, we'll just, we'll just say that some parts of what the apostles said were just for their day, were just for their their time. That's not what the Bible says. It says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is all God breathed that even the Old Testament we learn from it. They were given as examples, the scripture says. Why? So that we won't repeat the same mistakes that they made. So the teaching of the apostles is absolutely foundational. Now how would we define what the teaching of the apostles was. Well, this is very difficult to do in such a short space of time, isn't it? But we can say that that teaching was Christ-centered, that it was cross-centered. We can say that their worship focused on what we would call the tri-unity of the Godhead, the Trinity. But again, this is approached through the Lord Jesus Christ and through his atonement on the cross. There's no other way to approach God. So if you have a church that is teaching and that has its main core of its doctrine, if you examine the sermons and they're not Christ-centered, they're not cross-centered, they're not talking about God, they're not talking about uh, uh, the teaching of the apostles, then you, you ought to have questions about that. How devoted is that church, is that teaching, is that pastor to these things? Are they continuing steadfastly in the teaching of the apostles or is it teaching from some other source, some other area? 
a church that is known for being works centered is not centered on Christ, is it? Now, we're called to do good works, but if you're purely works centered, then you're not centered upon Christ. You're not uh, uh, Christocentric. If there's a church and it's centered upon Israel, then it's not centered upon Christ and his cross. Now, uh, the Bible talks about Israel. Paul talks about Israel. Well, that's not the main focus of the scriptures. Christ is the focus of the scriptures, of the, all the prophecies and everything come to, to, to focus in Christ. If you have a church that is man-centered, that's not good. It's not centered upon Christ. It's not centered upon his cross. Although, of course, the scriptures do deal with man himself. How was this teaching of the apostles communicated? Think of the main basics uh, of, of, of theology. Redemption, repentance, turning from your sins, turning to Jesus Christ, finding life in Christ. You listening girls? Finding life in Christ. Now you can go to a Bible college, you can go to a seminary and you can receive teaching on all these uh, topics. We have a theology class ourselves. You can, you, can, you can take hold of these doctrines and you can, as they say, study them down to the ground. Into the ground. You can, you can just look at every different aspect of it. Fantastic. But here's the problem. How do you teach these fundamental, important, and at times abstract, in a way, doctrines to, not academics, but fishermen, farmers, potters, shepherds, women who spend their lives scrubbing floors, cooking. How, how do you teach these things to them? Also, who's doing the teaching? Peter, uh, John, Acts 4.13, and they're described as unlearned and ignorant men. They're, they're not like William Lane Craig, not knocking him at all, but he's got two PhDs. One he studied in Munich or something, you know. That's not Peter, that's not John. So how are they going to communicate these deep theological truths to people who also are not? Uh, academics. How do those teachers who are unlearned and ignorant men, now they're not ignorant of the things of God, this is a clue, by man's standard they are unlearned, they're not properly qualified, but not by God's, because it is God who calls, gifts, and equips. See, and so their approach is not the same uh, as, as, a, as an academic approach, but it's taking the same theological principles and explaining them to a people who are, who are not really highly educated uh, at all. How, how do they do that? I think it's absolutely fascinating. The more I look into this, the more it becomes uh, apparent to me that when the apostles come along and they want to teach these, these important fundamental doctrines what do they do so when Paul wants to teach about the resurrection what does he do, let's find out 1 Corinthians 15 bringing some scriptures for you 1 Corinthians 15 22. Uh, well, we'll look at 21 and 22. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and so in Christ shall all be made alive. Paul references 
what we might call uh, the narrative of Adam, doesn't he? He starts to talk about Adam, and what happened to Adam. And therefore, uh, the, the people, if they are familiar with the story of Adam, start to see, oh, right, I understand what's going on. I know what happened to Adam. I know what he did. And therefore, it becomes apparent that through, through, although through Adam all die, through Christ all will be made alive. How does Paul teach what faith is? Does he start to talk in, in, in abstract uh, uh, terms? Well, let's have a look what he does. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Start at verse 1. So Paul here starts to talk about faith. He says, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So when Paul wants to talk about faith and what it is, he references the, uh, the narrative of Abraham, doesn't he? Okay, what does Peter do when he wants to teach soteriology uh, uh, about being saved? Well, he accesses the narrative, we might call it the story of Noah, doesn't he? So it's these Bible narratives, these Bible stories, if you will, that help us to understand what the theology of the Bible is. And uh, if you're teaching a people who are unlearned, one of the ways in which you can learn what theology is, what true theology is, is through the recounting of these stories and familiarity with what these stories are. What happened to Abraham? What happened to Noah? What happened to Adam? And so what you have then is a framework for discerning what is good theology and bad theology. A framework for understanding what is sound doctrine and what is unsound doctrine or error. Let me give you an example of this. So let's say uh, someone comes along and they start to teach universalism. This idea that, well, you know, uh, God is just going to save everybody in the end, doesn't matter who you are, whether you're uh, Buddhist or a Muslim or a Christian, one day God will just save everybody uh, uh, and so on. And they might even use uh, clever arguments. They might talk about, well, I don't think God is really like that. You know, God, God is kind. You know, God, the Bible says God is love. And they build an argument that in, in your mind might have some kind of plausibility. It might be logical. It might make sense. But when you fit it into the framework of the story of Noah, how does it fit? Did everybody get saved? No. Only those on the ark. Everybody outside of the ark perished. And that is why Peter uses that. He uses that narrative. He uses that story to teach what salvation is. That it is in Christ and in Christ alone, just as those who were saved are those who are in the ark, not outside of the ark. So it is those who will be saved who are those who are in Christ and not outside of Christ. So you can see how, you, how they taught the New Testament church. These people who, who were just saved 3,000 in one day. And, and they devote themselves, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the apostles' teaching. They, how did they do that when they're unlearned, uneducated? They familiarize themselves with the stories of the scriptures. And in that way, you, let me tell you, you can even teach a child about the depth of theology, about uh, uh, what these things mean. Because the more familiar they are with these, these, these Bible stories, the more they will get their theology right. Uh, we think, of, again, of, of Ruth and Boaz. Was it teach? Redemption. Yeah, Boaz is the kinsman redeemer, isn't he? Yeah, he, 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 he buys back Ruth in the same way Christ buys us back. 
by his own precious blood. So see how all these things um, are able to fit together. Of course, we're far more educated in our day. Uh, uh, you can access probably university level education in theology in a way that you never could even say 20 years ago. You can go on your computer and you can, you can just, they'll just come up, all these great university professors, and I'm not knocking, uh, uh, you know, uh, scholarly uh, theological teaching, but here's the thing. Many people, many Christians, imagine that the New Testament church, the early church, was teaching what they believe. No, they imagine that they can picture it in their mind. I can just picture them teaching what I believe. But that is the very question that is being begged. Was that actually the teaching of the apostles? Was it really? Or did that teaching, did that theology start during the Reformation? Or during the Enlightenment? Or in the 1800s? Or in the 1940s or the 1950s, or did it start a few years ago? And yet we picture in our minds, well, they must, yeah, they must have been teaching this, shouldn't they? How does your theology fit within these simple stories, these Bible narratives? Does it fit? Does it fit within that framework? Because that's what I believe. The New Testament church was using. I think that is the sample and the example of the teaching we have from Paul and Peter and others. It's, they reference the Old Testament. They reference these stories. Don't ever look down on telling Bible stories to children. You're preparing their hearts. You're preparing them to have a good understanding of what is sound doctrine and what is false doctrine. Doctrine. Good framework. Be very careful of, of trying to retranslate the scriptures to suit your belief system. That's what the JWs do. Right? Rather, take your, your theology, take your belief system, and see how does it fit in the story of Abraham? How does it fit in the story of Noah? How about how does it fit? with what I know the Bible reveals about Adam. If we don't do that, we are in danger of, of going around in intellectual circles. It becomes a sport. Let's talk about abstract ideas. Let's talk about that it becomes uh, uh, you know, a, a kind of oh, chin stroking. You know, it's not all about you know, just going around in our intellect. What do we think about this? How might that work? How does it fit in the framework of Bible narrative? That's what I think is important that we should do as a church. What does, is what I believe really what the apostles were teaching? I need to bring it to the Bible and see whether it fits. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph. Familiarize yourselves with these stories, with these Bible narratives. Familiarize yourself so that you can just stand up and, and just give the whole story. You know, this is the life of Abraham. This is what happened to him. This is Joseph. This is what happened to him. And you can just by memory know exactly what happened in their story. And then when something doesn't fit, when some theology doesn't fit, you can say, ah, now there might be a problem with this. Doctrine is important. Theology does matter. But it doesn't mean that they are the exclusive realms of the academic. The early church had a way of accessing good theology, a way of accessing sound doctrine. And I believe this was it. Taking those Bible narratives and, 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 and familiarizing themselves uh, with it. Uh, I don't think we need something new. In fact, I'm reminded of uh, John Wesley's quote, if it's new, it's not true, and if it's true, it's not new. In other words, if it's true, 
if it fits theologically, then you've not just discovered something new. It was there in the teaching of the apostles. You just didn't know about it. It's just come to light. But that's what the early church taught. And if it's brand new and nobody else has ever come up with it, then it's probably not true. We don't need something new. In fact, what we need are what is said in the words of Jeremiah. Ask for the old paths. It's time to brush away uh, the cobwebs, the bushes that have grown over those paths, those long neglected paths, and find them again and say, how did Abraham walk? How did Isaac walk? What did Joseph do? Find those old paths. What is the apostles' teaching? That's what I need to rediscover. I need to walk those old paths. Doesn't matter what new things are going on, what new ideas are coming out, but what are the old paths? The Bible says, wherein there is the good way. That's the good way to walk. Unfortunately, that, that, that uh, verse or that section goes on to say that the people said, we will not walk in them. And there are a lot of people today, when you present the old path and you say, this is the New Testament church, and they say, we will not walk in that way. Friends, we've got to reaffirm where we're walking this morning. Are we on that hard, narrow path, that narrow way? Are we walking the right way, the way that God has called us to walk? This church will, will be wasting its time if it is not walking in that narrow way. We can have a nice time together, we can have a, a, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, we can, talk, we can catch up with the news from one another, we can have a great time. But it's all in vain unless we're walking. The narrow way. It is all in vain unless we are walking the old paths. Let us reevaluate our lives. Let's have uh, the conviction before God, the desire for, for paths of righteousness, for His name's sake, to examine ourselves in the light of the Scriptures and in the light of our great commission, this great call upon our lives. To share the gospel with others. Let's support one another in doing that. Let's have that unity to walk as Christ has called us to walk this morning. And let's be a New Testament church. Let's pray. Amen.